first Living Legends webinar. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Sally Roberts. I am the CEO of Wrestle Like a Girl, the national advocacy organization for girls and women in the sport of wrestling. We're a federally registered 501c3 and generous donations allow us to provide more programming for girls and women in the wrestling and leadership space that we provide. Living Legends, it's a program that we're kicking off in 2023 to be able to provide educational opportunities to our coaches that are within the wrestling landscape by featuring Living Legends within the sport. I want to thank you all for joining us today. We have a special guest, Team USA's great, Harry Steiner, the head coach of, US, of the U.S. Women's Wrestling National Team. We are thrilled Coach Steiner has taken time out of his busy schedule to share his wisdom with us today. For now, I want to turn it over to Julia Salata, Senior Manager of Women's Collegiate Initiatives for Wrestle Like a Girl, who will share with you a women's wrestling national landscape update. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Sally, for that introduction. Uh, again, my name is Julia Salata, and I've been working with Wrestle Like a Girl for the past four years. My role has expanded as the organization has grown. I currently serve as the Senior Manager for Women's Collegiate Advancement, and we're currently focusing on women's college wrestling with a special focus on NCAA emerging sports status and that transition to championship sports status. There's a lot of powerful movement happening across the nation, and I'm thrilled to be able to share with you some of these updates, uh, knowing that each of you have played a role in some way to help these numbers come to fruition. At the end of last season, back in the spring of 2022, there were nearly 34,000 girls that were wrestling during that season, and we expect our 2022-2023 numbers to be over 50,000 at the conclusion of this season, uh, once we take our final tally this spring. This is largely due to the, sanction of girl, to the sanctioning of girls wrestling in many states across the country, and we currently have 36 states who have sanctioned the sport or are currently recognizing it in that emerging sports status within their high school athletic association. This growth is huge for our collegiate pipeline and the continued development of women's collegiate wrestling, as it means we're increasing our pool of recruitable athletes, both in terms of quality and quantity, as women's wrestling continues to explode at the high school level. For this first show, I want to share with you guys some NCAA-specific information, uh, and in future shows, I'll be sharing updates and information for the other collegiate sport governing bodies as well, uh, the NAI, the National Junior College Athletic Association, all of those. Uh, women's wrestling is currently recognized by the NCAA as an emerging sport, and we're working diligently in order to successfully transition to full championship sports status and to have our first NCAA Women's Wrestling Championship soon. There is a, a process to become a championship sport. In order to do so, we need to have 40 programs who all meet the minimum criteria needed to claim emerging sports sponsorship. Currently, we have 77 programs who either currently uh, sponsor the sport uh, in terms of them either currently competing or they have announced they'll begin competing in this next calendar year. Of those 77, at least 40 of those programs must meet the minimum criteria needed to consider them an emerging sport sponsored school. Uh, that's what we need in order to attain championship sports status. To meet the criteria for emerging sports sponsorship, programs must attend a certain amount of competitions with a certain amount of athletes at each of those competitions. For NCAA Division I programs, they must attend at least 13 events with at least seven athletes participating at those events. For NCAA Division II programs, they must attend at least nine events with at least six of those athletes participating. And for NCAA Division III schools, they must attend at least seven events with the minimum of six athletes competing at each of those seven events. This season, we've already we already have 25 programs who have met those criteria, and we anticipate hitting that minimum number of 40 programs in the next two weeks. Uh, we're tracking that very diligently right now, and we're on track. If there's any way Wrestling a Girl can help support your program, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, we'd love to connect with you and serve as a resource to you in any way that we can. Last thing for me, uh, we're currently working on a new project called Raising Our Game, the Women's Wrestling Report. This is a document that is currently being created and, and will provide a snapshot of the current landscape of women's wrestling across the country at all levels. Raising Our Game is a national effort and we are very excited to share it with all of you at the beginning of quarter two. That's all for me. Uh, on behalf of Wrestling a Girl, I'm very grateful for all of your support of the work that we're doing, and I'm so thrilled to have been able to share these updates with you today. I'll be available at the end of the session as well during the Q&A portion if anyone has any additional questions, and I would be happy to provide as many answers as I can. Uh, so thank you all again. Sally, thank you for your, uh, the time to share everything that we have been working on, and I'll pass it back to you. Thank you, Julia. I'm thrilled to introduce our living legend for this webinar, Terry Steiner. Terry is a native of Bismarck, North Dakota. He wrestled at the University of Iowa under the legendary coach Dan Gable, 
and in 1993 won an NCAA Division I national championship. He's entering his fifth Olympic cycle as the women's national team head coach. He's the longest serving national coach in USA Wrestling under USA Wrestling's program. Under his leadership, the USA women's team has been a world power since the sport emerged in the late 1980s. Under coach Steiner, the USA team placed, placed second in the 2003 World Championships and has been third at the World Championships eight times. The Olympic Games does not keep an official team score, but unofficially, uh, Team USA was second in 2004 and third in 2008 and continuing to build on those accolades. Steiner was inducted into the National Wrestling Hall of Fame in 2013. Harry, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks, Sally, and thanks, Julia, for all you do. And, and uh, it's an honor for me to be here to speak with all of you today and hopefully share some knowledge and, and then keep moving this sport forward. Coach Steiner, you've had a storied career in wrestling at the University of Iowa. What did you learn about, about this sport, about wrestling, that, brought, that you brought with you into your coaching career? Well, I, I think I learned right away how, how tough winning really is, right? And, and to, to achieve anything at a high level, um, you have to be all in, right? You have to be willing to give uh, the time of your life to it. And, and, and not like every waking moment, but your energies and your focus has to be there. And, and um, But there's no guarantees, right? With that, you also understand that that there's no guarantees um, during this journey. And, and so at the University of Iowa, it, it became very clear that right away that the, the environment was there, the coaching was there, the training partners were there, but but nothing was gonna be handed to you and nothing was gonna be given to you. You were gonna have to earn everything that you got. And, and um, you know, if you were up for that challenge, then great things could happen. But I think you have to, you, you have to go in and really enjoying the process and the journey because that's really where the riches of the sport are. And that's hard to see when you're a competitor. Um, but, you know, now looking back on it, um, you know, really, those are the things that really mattered that, that you really learned and moved forward in life with were, were the, the life lessons along the way. And, and so I would just, you know, being happy, you have to be happy without having that end goal, right? Um, because it may never come. But you have to enjoy that journey along the way because that that's where you're going to spend most of your time in, in the journey, not on top of the award stand, right? And and so, I, I think if you um, can learn to enjoy that process, uh, and and sometimes it's very mundane and it's very tough, and but if you can learn it, learn to enjoy that process, um, uh, then you you've already won, you've already won the, the battle and and really what you're out to to get. Um, you know, as an athlete, you don't want to hear that as an athlete, you're, you're there to get one thing and, and winning is the only thing that matters. But, but I think when you're my age, you, you realize there's a lot more important things in life than, than just the medal around your neck. And, and, um, you know, that's really what the experiences and the, and the life lessons that you're trying to move forward. So. Is there any advice or coaching that you were hesitant to accept as an athlete, but as a coach, you now see the value in it? Um, I don't know. Not, I don't think, not really. I mean, I, I grew up in a generation where um, you didn't question authority, right? You, you listened and there was really no reason for me to question coach Dan Gable, right? I mean, right. This guy, by the time I got there, he already won, I believe, nine championships, uh, NCAA championships, and his Olympic gold medal and world medal as an athlete. And and so really, there was no reason to question him, right? You just fell in line and and followed his lead. And then I think that was a great thing is he he definitely gave you a lead to follow, right? And, and, and um, you didn't have to look far to see what was successful because you could see him every day uh, still doing at least a trace of what he did when he was an athlete. So um, no, I, I don't think there was things I, ne I never really bought into. Um, I think you all, you figure out your own style and your own philosophy along the way, but there definitely 
there's more things uh, that I've taken with me from Coach Gable that, I, that I've left behind. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And not only do you look out for your athletes, but you're also a proud dad of a daughter, Raven. How did becoming a father and raising your daughter change the way that you think about coaching? Well, I, again, I, th I think you realize, uh, number one, but the kids are watching, right? So you have to lead by example. You can say one thing and do another, and they're going to follow what you do. And and so I think you have to understand that, and you have to lead by example. Uh, the life you want um, someone to live, you have to you have to live that life, and then the kids will follow suit, right? And and the, and they also understand that they're listening. So make sure. <laughs> the messaging you're giving out is, is worth listening to. Right. And, and so I, I don't know, to me, coaching has always been um, a lot like parenting, right? It's about empowering people. Um, it's about putting them out there, uh, giving them some direction, letting them fail, um, but let them fail forward. Right. And, and help them help pick them up and, and go forward again. But you have to empower people to, um, to try things and to do things and that they don't have to be perfect. Um, um, so I, I think that's really how I've, I've thought about coaching my whole time through is it's no different than raising a kid. When, when my daughter was eight years old, she needed me a lot. Now she's 22. She shouldn't need me as much, right? She shouldn't need my direction every day. She shouldn't be calling me on the phone, asking me for all kinds of of a direction, uh, maybe some advice once in a while, maybe just to say hello, but, but really, I don't, I don't, if, if she's needing me now as much as she did when she was eight years old, then I haven't done my job as a parent. And I, I think as a coach, it's the same way you, you empower people, you put them on the right path, you let, you let them fail, you pick them back up again and put them back on the path. And, and, and hopefully in time, they start to figure this out on their own and they should need you less and less. And, and really, that that's what coaching is uh, to me it's it's a form of parenting um you know the, the hard part is is i think when you're a coach you're spending a lot of time with someone else's kids right so so you're you're always wondering um is my child getting what they need right, right. because i'm spending you spend a lot of waking hours uh with with any any job but with with coaching, it's it's not really a job; it's a lifestyle. So so you you spend a lot of time on the job, right? And and sometimes your kids spend a lot of time alone, and so you want to make sure that uh, you're including them along the process, and and you're making sure they hear the messages, and and pick up from the sport, even if they're not involved in it directly, uh, indirectly. You you want them to learn the same values and the same life lessons, and so. Um, I think that's that's where I look at coaching and 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 parenting and you know yes I think coaching and and the athletes I've been around over the years um, have had a great influence not only on myself but my family and my daughter and and uh, that's how it should be. You're known as a transformational coach who guides athletes to the, to live their lives to their full potential. What are the values for your team and, and how do these values influence your day-to-day -day interactions with these athletes? I don't know. I, I think it's the same values that, that I grew up with uh, that my parents passed on to me. And, and it's the same values that make you successful in anything in life or, or any, any relationship successful, any any kind of organization successful, any kind of partnership successful. I mean, and there, there has to be an honesty to it. We have to be able to, to deal with people straightforward and, and know that uh, you're getting a straight answer when you're talking. And there has to be a, a respect between differences and between individuals. So I would say honesty and respect are huge. I think without those uh, two things, um, not much is possible. Right, you there has to be a respect and 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 an honesty when you're dealing with people. Um, I would say the other, you know, the key words I would use are, are discipline. There has to be a discipline. You have to do the right things, even when you don't want to do the right things. And um, and 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 that sometimes is the hard part, right? As we know what to do, and it's you know, in in theory, it's easy to follow 
probably follow the line and you know connect the dots but doing it is another thing on a daily basis day in day out and so there has to be discipline to what you're doing uh, there has to be a professional integrity and a personal integrity to what you're doing um, this this job uh, you know or as an athlete uh, to win championships is going to require a lot of you and it's going to be a lot of things that maybe some people aren't willing to do and so you there has to be an integrity to that when you don't feel like doing that right and then I think lastly it, um, it would be just having patience right because this is a process and winning is a process and and anything good in life um usually doesn't come overnight maybe winning the lottery I would I would like to see how that is sometime but but until then I'll have some patience and understand that you know whether you're building wealth or you're building relationships or you're building a champion athlete uh, that takes time right and there's going to be hard times along the way and pitfalls along the way and and that's okay you know so let's just learn from those along the way and move forward I, I don't think it's ever where, where we're standing but what what direction are we heading what direction are we going and I think that's um you know just have patience I, th I see a lot of impatient people in today's world right we want everything a snap of our fingers you know we, we have the internet but it's not fast enough you know um and so that's kind of how our society is trending but but I think anything really worthwhile it's going to take some time. And, and so uh, along with those other virtues, I would say patience is a, a huge one. And speaking of the process of taking time, let's, let's talk about the women's college wrestling landscape. Women's wrestling at the college level, it's freestyle. Why is it freestyle? And what are the benefits women wrestlers get from being in a different sport from their male counterparts who do uh, folk style? Well, I, I think, you know, it definitely, it helps us internationally. When, it, when you're looking at it from my seat, right, from being the national team coach, I mean, we, we want to be in the same style from, you know, when we start wrestling, right? I'd, I'd rather have one style. The rest of the world is only dealing with one style or, you know, two styles with freestyle and Greco. But, but for women's wrestling, they're dealing with one style of wrestling all the way through their careers. And in the U.S., we have this folk style that kind of takes us off, off course a little bit or, or gets us a late start, I would say. Um, so we're definitely at, at the advantage right now because we have our college system at, at the in a freestyle style of wrestling, uh, which, you know, it just gives us four more years where we can zero in and focus on, on freestyle wrestling, you know, and if we could ever move that back to the high school level, then we'd have eight more years, you know, where we can get people fully entrenched into freestyle wrestling. But having the college system freestyle is, is a huge step in the right direction for, for women's wrestling in this country. And it allows us to be more competitive earlier on the international stage. You know, I mean, we've had some young champions. This year, Amit Elor won you know, as a, as a youngest world champion ever in U.S. history at 18 years old, but that's a rare, you know, that's a rare product, right? And and so, um, you know, hopefully, hopefully we can have more of that, you know, and, and with, I think, the focus with with coaches and athletes and parents knowing that that the future for their daughters is in freestyle wrestling, hopefully, you know, there will be more of a focus uh, put on that at an earlier age, but having our college system there right now is a definite advantage for for the U.S. women's program. Yeah. As we look to advance women's wrestling, there's a strong group of stakeholders who have come together to help grow the sport. Do you think that that collective group has been effective in growing women's wrestling, and, and if so, why? Well, absolutely. I mean, you you can't move this sport forward alone, right? And and you you need people speaking the same language. You need people giving the same messages, right? And having all of our our stakeholders, you know, on the same on the same wavelength and and giving the same message out and knowing the correct information and knowing, 
you know, what our opportunities are out there. I, I mean, that that definitely helps because, uh, you know, I think that's always the hard part with a country as ma as vast as we are, right, is the communication, right, is getting the, the correct communication out to everyone, all the stakeholders, the, the grassroots level, the parent, the new parents that are bringing their kids into the sport, even at, even people that have been in the sport, uh, maybe as male athletes for a long time, but now they have daughters to know the pathway, right? To know, know the pathway and, and know what's available and the opportunities within the sport. The, the more as our large stakeholders um, are all on the same page and working together, the, the better it is. So it's, it's made a, a huge impact, right? Uh, when we have clear direction, you know, we know, number one, we know where we started from. Uh, we know where we are right now and, and, and we have clear goals and a vision of where we want to be uh, down the road. So I think that those things are, are very important as we move forward and then we grow the sport. And as we look at the national landscape, while reminding that this, this conversation is really targeted towards college coaches, what role does a coach play in growing girls and women's wrestling, male or female, women's program or not? Well, I mean, there's so many roles. I, mean, I think as a coach, you're wearing so many hats as a coach. Um, but um, number one, you, you have to set the tone, right? You have to set the course and and what you want your program to stand for, right? And and, and number one, you're, you're raising not only athletes, you're raising human beings, right? And and you're given direction. So let, let's let's raise some human beings that have um, moral values and, and ethical values and, and things that are going to help them be successful in any any arena they choose in life, right? So number one, set the tone and and set some standards for your program that that are going to move people forward, not hold them back. So I think that's that's a huge job. The, you know, as a coach, you're also that your room should be a safe haven, right? That should be a place of, of safety where people know they can come in and try things and learn and, and, but not always have to be perfect, right? They can be themselves and they can, they can um, have failure along the way and that's okay and, and understand that that's part of the process. Um, but the, the, the wrestling room has to be a place where you can get away from everything, right? And that's kind of that safe haven where, where this is where you can focus on bettering yourself and then worrying about yourself only, no matter what's happening outside in life and well, whether it's your personal life or your classes or, or anything like that, that, that wrestling room should be a place where you can focus on your improvement. And, and I think that that it has to be like that. Otherwise, um, you know, if, if, the, if it's a struggle to come to practice, if there's stress to be in practice, um, that's not, it's not a place where people are going to hang out very often, right. And want to be, and then that should be a place of, of really serenity and then fun where people want to be. And, and, um, not that you're not going to be challenged and, and pushed and things like that, but in, in a different way, you should at least feel safe there and, and know that you can be yourself and be a hundred percent yourself. So I think those are when you're trying to establish uh, positive culture and, and things like that. Those are the first things. Put the athlete first, right? And and understand that they they have more things going on in life than just what happens between those four walls of a wrestling room every day. And and make it a place where they can enjoy and 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 um, let themselves grow. And you you've coached some of the best athletes in the world. How do you ensure each athlete is meeting their potential? How do you determine what kind of motivation each athlete will respond to? And how do you employ different motivational tactics for each of those different personalities? You know, that, that's the challenge of it. I think there's a lot of science out there. Um, but when you're dealing with human beings, it can't be just science, right? And uh, there's an art to it, you know? And, and it's, it has to be a mixture because you can have all the right strategies and, and plans. And, and then all of a sudden there's going to be an athlete that comes through those doors that doesn't operate like that. Right. And you're going to have to figure out how they operate and what brings the best out. And those, 
those people. And, and that comes through building a relationship, right? You, hey, you have to have a relationship to really get to the depths of that and to find out what moves people forward. And, and so, you know, I, I think that it's really just finding, finding that out, right? And, 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 and creating an environment where people are gonna open up and communicate and, and, and they feel comfortable with you or where you can find out what moves them forward, you know, and also, you know, you still have to, you know, you can bend to individuals and you have to, as, as a coach, you have to give to individual needs. But I, I think also it's keeping a, a certain standard within your program and your team that, that some things are negotiable and some things are not right. right. And, and uh, I think it's, it's that balance between that, you know, it's an individual sport, but there has to be certain values that everyone on, on the team has to adhere to. And then it's, it's finding that right balance. And, you know, a lot of times it's never black and white, you know, and people always want black and white answers and, and clear, uh, you know, divisive and uh, just defined answers like that, but that's, that's not how life is. And I don't, that's not how coaching is it. I think that, most of the time we operate in that gray area, right? And, and I think it's finding, you know, where, where in that spectrum, you know, what shade of gray are we gonna, are we gonna operate in, right? I think is more um, how I've always thought about it. I, I don't like uh, having very strict and clear definitions for, for what's happening uh, within a room because um, there's always gonna, it's, it's still situational. And it's still, you're coming down to human beings and it's nice, you know, that's where the, I, I think it gets misconstrued between science and art, right? Is uh, in science, maybe there's very clear lines on how things operate. Um, in art, there's not. And I think that there's definitely a balance in there that you have to find as a coach with, with each individual on your team and then figure out how they work. So. And what hap what happens on the wrestling mat is obviously your focus, but there's more to an athlete's life than just wrestling. Faith, family, community, and activism are common components of the athlete's day-to-day -day experience off the wrestling mat. How do you help your athletes live up to the values they set for themselves? Well, I, I think it's it's understanding that that wrestling, although it may be very important to us and it may be very important in our lives at a certain point, it's not everything. And it shouldn't be, right? If, if wrestling is the most important thing in our lives, we probably have some issues, right? I mean, and we, we, need, we need more balance than that, right? We need some balance in our lives. And, and, you know, and, and that's hard to say, you know, because there's a lot of times I'm spending more time in the wrestling room or on wrestling tours and, and around wrestling coaches than I am my own family. But it doesn't mean that it's more important just because I'm spending more time in those areas, right? It's, uh, you know, I think that at different times of the year, just like anything, it, you're, you're gonna focus on different things, right? And, yeah. and there's gonna be times during the wrestling season or during the year, you know, as we get geared up to the world championships or the Olympic games that, you know, wrestling is gonna take a top priority, but there's also gonna be times during the course of the year that, that wrestling is not going to be the highest priority. Of course, it's a priority because it's my job, but, and there's individuals involved, but, but um, at the end of the day, there has to be some balance there, a work-life balance. And, and that's different for everyone in different stages of their lives. You know, it was a lot harder for me when we were raising a daughter, right? And um, my daughter was at home every day and it was a lot different then than it is right now, right? Now she's uh, in college and uh, not living at home. And, and so it's a lot either that balance doesn't have to be the same, right? And then so actually, I think my job has become a lot easier from that standpoint now. Um, but there's still other things in life. And I think the same for athletes, you know, you have to understand that, that um, you know, there's other things going on in their lives, right? And then you're going to have to take those into account and, and understand how important they are to those individuals. And, and um, again, operate, um, I guess, with the presence of mind, knowing that this is their career, uh, not yours. And, and you're, you're here to guide them, but not dictate to them. 
And I think that that's a big um, part of how I was raised, uh, both by my parents and, and coaches that I was around. Um, um, they understood that there was, there needed to be some kind of balance there. Yeah. And what role can a coach play in making sure their team is a positive force within the wrestling community? There's so many programs that have girls and they ask us, what can I do to support my, my female wrestlers going out and becoming advocates? What are your thoughts on how coaches can support their athletes and being that positive force within the community? Well, I think it's backing up and, and, you know, first of all, helping your athletes understand that the reason they're in the positions they are in, you know, maybe they're at your college and they got a scholarship and they're uh, going there and they're on the national team and they're one of America's best or they're on the world team and they're, they're representing, you know, there, there's a lot of people that help make that happen, right? And understand that, yeah, they were the principal part of that, but there was a lot of people that made that happen along the way. Right. And, and because of that, um, you know, because of the situation that they're in right now, the current situation as a world team member, as a national team member, as a college team member, that they, they have a voice, right? They have a position that people are listening to and people are looking towards them. And then because of that voice, what can we do to move, whether it's the sport or the society forward? because of that voice, right? Let's use our voices in the right way. Let's use our, 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 the podium that we're on in the, in the way that we can enhance society and, and move, you know, move society forward and move our sport forward or, or whatever that is and, and really move the next generation forward, right? Because there's a lot of young girls out there that are watching, right? Whether you think they are or not, they're watching. Right. And and because, you know, when we have our world team members, our world champions and world medalists and national team members, you know, when they make it to this stage, that's part of the territory, whether you whether you want to believe that or not, or you if you whether you want that responsibility or not, it comes with comes with the territory of what you've accomplished at, at a certain point. It's helping athletes understand that at a certain point in their careers, their careers become more than just about them, right? And it becomes about the people that they're influencing and the people that help them along the way. And it's time to give back to both, right? Yeah. And, and so. As we talk about moving society forward, what are some life lessons you've learned from your coaches and youth sport experiences that have nothing to do with sport, that have just helped make your life great or they've given you some educational pearls of wisdom that you can carry along the way i don't know when I, you know when i when i get asked this question um the first thing that always comes to mind is is dealing with adversity right um if there's one thing i've gained from the sport it's it's dealing with adversity and and knowing that um through my trials and tribulations and struggles in the sport and trying to be successful in the sport, through that, through that journey, uh, I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot about not just um, keeping my eye and my focus on what I can control and ha handle myself, uh, take my energies away from the things I can't control, um, but just you know, just understanding that I, I can control, I can control my emotions, I can control how I react to situations, right? And, and that, that's been learned through wrestling and knowing that no matter what happens in my life, that, that I know I can rise above it, right? And, and I think that that's the first thing I would say. The next thing is, and this is hard, and we've already talked about it some, is really enjoy the journey, yeah. right? You, you have to enjoy this journey and, and not just the good days, right? Because you don't want to wish half your life away. There's going to be bad days that you have to find the good in. There's always a silver lining to every mishap, right? That every, every bad thing or what you think is an unanswered prayer or a bad thing, there's probably something you can learn from it and move forward from it. So it really and enjoy this journey for what it is, right? I don't think we're here on this earth to to, you know, that's supposed to be a sunny day every day, right? It's, it's about enjoying where we're at, no matter what the circumstance, right? And, and being able to enjoy that. And I think that 
wrestling can really teach you that because it is such a humbling sport, right? I mean, there's there's days when it seems like you do nothing right, right? But let's let's still find something that we can take from that. Um, and then I would just say, you know, just look looking for ways to give back, right? I mean, just look for ways to give back. There, there's so many people that have helped all of us uh, in the, to the situations we're in and, and the, the job I'm in for the last 20 years, right? That happened because I was around a lot of great people, right? And a lot of great mentors and that helped move me forward and helped shape me who I am today. And, and um, you know, are there ways I can give back to their causes and, and to what they're doing? And and you know, and, and hopefully help the next generation um, to to be able to enjoy life like like I've enjoyed it. So so I, I think that's what I always look to. What is it about great coaching that transcends sport, and why is it so relevant in today's world, especially as we talk about girls and women's wrestling? Well, I, I think it's because of. Um, you know, there's just, there's just so many, um, you know, sport is like a microism of life, right? I mean, it's, it's, it, there's, there's so many life lessons to learn from, from the hardships in the sport, as we've talked, that are going to prepare us and prepare the next generation that, that I think that, um, that, that's what it's about, right? That's really what it's about. And, and what are those things? I've talked about some of them, right? Dealing with adversity, uh, learning how to deal with life as it comes to us, right? And and not just wishing for what we want, but uh, you know, it, as soon as you think you have everything figured out, everything changes, right? I mean, we 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 can have a plan, and and then God has a different plan, right? Um, and so I think that you know, just dealing with life as it comes, learning to deal with adversity. Um, you know, the work ethic that we learn from, from sport, uh, and, the, and, you know, it, it takes a lot to be successful as, as we started this conversation. You know, when I, when I first got to the University of Iowa, I never scored a point in the practice room for the first three months. You know, you, you realize that, man, this is not going to be easy, right? This is going to be a struggle. You know, when I first, um, my first year with, uh, with the women's national team, right? We went to the world championships. We were, we were 11th in the world. Yeah. And I thought we had a great team and we did have a great team. Maybe not a great coach at the time, but we had a great team, right? And so you you came back from that and you realize, well, there's a lot of work to do, yeah. right? There's a lot of work. We got to get to work. So the, I think, you know, learning that work ethic, you know, and the humility, again, the humility is always going to come back. This sport is the most humbling Thing there is and and i think if we can learn how to deal with the, those disappointments and um along the way um uh, we've learned a lot and you know i think just the other thing that i think is kind of it's it's becoming a lost thing in our society is loyalty right yeah. is, is just uh appreciation for people that have been with you and behind you uh, along the way and along your journey, I think, and, and giving that back, you know, giving that loyalty back. And, and for me, you know, you know, the partner has been wrestling too, right? Just the sport of wrestling. It's stayed yeah. with me, right? And, and it's given me so much and, and hopefully I can give a lot back to it, right? Um, but there's so many things, there's so many things that, that you can't learn in a book, right? That you have to learn being out in the field and doing it and 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 the wrestling is that right you 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 have to get out there and feel it and put your hands on it and and you have to learn the hard way a lot of times right you have to learn what not to do thousands of times before we figure out the right way to do something and and that's okay that's okay it, the success is a process and yeah and being a head coach is leading a team being a CEO is leading a team. How can people in those supervisory roles at their work develop their coaching skills to help their employees achieve what they're capable of? I mean, coaching is everywhere and it's not often that people realize they're sitting in their seats until they've been on the journey. Yeah, how can we, um, 
I, I think, you know, just number one, uh, trust in the people in front of you, right? Empower them, empower them, give them some guidance and direction, but let them, let them get out there and do what they do. Right. And, and then, you know, again, help them, help them through the struggle, right? Help them through the struggle, help them, uh, let them fail. I mean, we don't have to be perfect, right? We're never going to be perfect. So I think so many times we want the right thing done right away. And, and you can't, you know, you, it's a process, right? To learn how to do the right thing. Right? Can we fail forward? Can we grow forward from our failures? And, and um, I think that it's, it's a lot harder when people come into a room or, or people come into your program as coaches as well, and, and you don't let them try some things on their own, right? You can give them direction, but you have to empower them and trust, put some trust in them and let them, let them do some things on their own to figure that out and then come back to the table and say, how could have we done that different, right? How could have we maybe done a better job of communicating or whatever? And I think, um, but you have to let people be them, their own people, right? You have to let them be themselves, right? Because we're all eventually going to have our own philosophy and how we do things. So yeah, maybe you'll have some influence on that, but don't, don't try to dictate, don't take people's creativity away. Everyone's picture at the end of the day is going to look a little bit different when they're painting, right? And their, their vision for what, or their the picture of what their, their vision is, right, is going to be a little bit different. Right. And it's not wrong, right or wrong. In most cases, it's a different way of doing things. And I think sometimes that we, we, we try to be everything to everyone. Right. And I think we have to take a step back and realize that that's almost impossible to do. Right. And there's going to be, you're going to have assistant coaches. You may be a great coach, but you're going to have assistant coaches that relate a lot better to certain individuals on that team let them let them deal with those situations and those teams and maybe they deal with certain situations better right let them deal with those things and don't try to uh, take a step back with your ego and understand that maybe we don't know everything right um but but i think uh if you can do that i think people are gonna um have the ability to grow and move forward and and become the you know the people that they want to become and the leaders that they that you want them to become. And I know that we have a few parents that have tuned into this webinar as well. How can parents apply coaching principles to raising kids and helping them develop confidence and resilience? We've, we've touched on it a, a little bit, you know, nurturing them, helping them move forward. Are there any other points that you want to add or any other tidbits of wisdom? Yeah, I would just say, again, I would say, see the big picture, right? See that this is going to be if, if your kid's going to be involved in this sport and going to gain the riches from the sport, and really that's what it's about, right? It, it shouldn't be about the winning and losing. It should be what can they gain from being in the environment that they're in every day, that you're putting them in three days a week, you know, for two hours a day. What can they gain from that environment, right? And, and there's so much to learn and there's so much development going on. So see the big picture of it. Let your kids fail. I let them fail and let them fall on their face and, and help help them pick themselves, you know, you're there to help pick them back up and point them in the right direction again and then teach them how to handle the adversities of the day, right? That's what sport is about and that's what it should be about, right? And, and I want to tell us just a personal story, you know, when I, when I was a young kid getting started in this, I was very, very, very fortunate to have a father who, who understood this very quickly and then it was we were at a competition probably we were probably eight or nine years old and and my father we came off the mat and we probably didn't win or you know and I obviously we didn't win but we were upset and he got upset right and he he yelled at us but he was smart enough to realize that um that how much it set us back, right? And that was the last time, the first time was also the last time that he ever did that. And from that point on, he was just the there to give you the fuel, right? There to give you the motivation, there to give, the, give you the pat on the back, there to buy you the ice cream cone after practice, whatever, 
right? It was not about, it was never about accomplishment. It was just about do your best. And, and I think that um, if you can be there and be proud of them, your kids, no matter what happens, and understand that the real riches of the sport are in the process and the learning and the development of them as a human being, I think then, then, uh, then you're on to the right track. And, you know, you can't, you can't start this process thinking someone's going to be the Olympic champion. That's a pretty high hurdle that most of us are never going to be at, right? But they're going to develop into strong human beings and, and a better part of the society because of their involvement within this sport and around um, the environment that this sport creates. So um, just keep the big picture in mind. And I have one last question and then we'll go to our Q&A. So for those of you that are at home watching, there is a chat box where you can drop in your questions. We have a handful of, that have come in and we'll get to those. So Coach Steiner, last question before we move on. On a personal level, what is the kindest recognition or thank you that you've received from one of your athletes? Uh, that, that's a really hard question. And, and I don't know if there's been one that I can um, just uh, put out there. I, I don't think it's that. I think it's more just seeing people move on in their lives, right? Seeing people and understanding how their time with you in that wrestling room helped develop them and that they're moving on and they're happy in their lives and their their lives aren't trouble-free, okay? Because that's not realistic, but but that they can handle those troubles as they come. And and I think that that's, that's the biggest thing, you know? And I think, you know, it brings me back to, the, and this was told me a long time ago, and some of you may have heard me say this before, but, you know, a, a friend of mine um, who's a, a coach, uh, international coach, asked me this question one time, and the difference between an artist and a coach. And I, I said, I don't know. And he, he said, well, the, here's the difference. He said, at the end of the day, the artist can crumble up his work and throw it away and start over. And as a coach, you can't. As a coach, you're influencing lives every day by how you walk into that room and, and what you say to athletes and are you empowering them or you're crippling them. Um, you, you don't get that time back. You're influencing them and you can't start over just because you screwed up today. So I would say understand the importance of what you're doing right and 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 um just trying to be the best person you can be and 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 move people forward so um you know i would say the kindest recognition uh, it really it's it's seeing people successful in their lives right and seeing people that have moved on into different different uh venues and and different areas of focus in their lives and and just uh are successful and happy doing what they're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll move on to our question and answer session. The first question comes in from Chloe Ivanoff. When an athlete transitions to the collegiate level, how can they best advocate for themselves when they are working with new coaches, particularly if an athlete feels like the coaches don't care? Um, that's... That's I can a, ask, and that one's yeah, over to Terry and Julia. So you both are free to respond. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I think first, you, I would say just step back a little bit as, as, a, as an athlete, you know. I mean, I think you got to step back and really see what this coach is trying to figure out too. I mean, you, you're both on the same, you're just on opposite sides of the table, but you're both trying to get to the same result, right? And I would say that try to understand how they're trying to do things. And, and maybe you have to have that conversation. Um, but, you know, I can assure you that as a coach, um, if you're not successful as an athlete, that doesn't help that coach either, right? And so he may have a different way of doing things or, or she may have a different way of doing things, but, but it doesn't mean it's not right and it doesn't mean it can't help, right? And, and I think that, um, and it doesn't mean your way is wrong or right either, right? There might be a compromise in the middle somewhere, but I think, yeah, I think you have to um, 
again, be patient in that process a little bit and, and make sure that you're uh, working with the coach, communicating your needs and your, your wants and, and the goals of where you want to be. I think that, I think there's a lot of miscommunication too, that, you know, we, we think that everyone at the Olympic training center wants to be the Olympic champion, right? But do they? It's not always the case, right? And and so, so I think you know you have to really understand what people's goals are as well. So, just to kind of expand on that a little bit, um, I, I think the most important part of advocating for yourself as a college athlete is being willing to start the conversation. Uh, college coaches have five million things they're working on uh, outside of practice with recruiting, uh, fundraising, you know, dealing with their administrative tasks, things like that. And if an athlete doesn't let us know that something is going on or that they're not feeling seen or heard, a lot of times the coach doesn't know. We're, we're not mind readers. Um, so the best way to advocate is to start the conversation, being willing to um, just come in and, and sit down on your coach's couch, wherever it may be, and, and express your concerns. And I think more often than not, you'll find out the coach does care. Um, they just they, they didn't know. They don't know what they don't know. So uh, that, that that's the best advice. Start the conversation. And, and usually I, I find it's pretty productive. Another question that's come in from Sherrick Cobb. I see a lot of anxiety in my high school girl wrestlers. How do they, do they see it in other parts of the country and how do we handle it? How do you, how do you guys deal with anxiety? Terry Steiner, you, uh, you've dealt with this a few times. Yeah, yeah. No, well, I think the first thing is, you know, I think when anxiety comes in, we're, we're worried about result too much most of the time, right? I mean, we're worried about the end result and, uh, are we going to get our hand raised or not? And, and it shouldn't be about that, right? It's being the best you you can be that day and, and focusing on the things you can control, focusing on the process of it. If you can help them focus on the process of where's my head supposed to be? Where's my hand supposed to be? You know, what, which leg am I supposed to attack? You know, focus on the process of winning, get them thinking about that instead of the end result. I think because when you focus on facts, there's not much anxiety to it, right? I mean, it's just, you're following a plan, right? And, and so, and, and, and also I think making sure they understand that we don't have to be perfect, right? We can make mistakes and still win a wrestling match, yeah. right? And we're not gonna be perfect. So uh, I think that's how I would handle it. Next question comes in from Maxine Lizotte. What fundamentals in skill, strategy, and mindset should a high school coach promote in girls wrestling to help them transition from folk style to freestyle in college? I would say first, fo first focus, well, let's look at the things that are similar, right? And I think we, we make it a lot different than it needs to be. Let's focus the things that can work, what you've learned in folk style and how you can transition that over to freestyle and, and what is... Uh, a lot of the same. And then we can start talking about differences with it, but I don't think it has to be that different, right? I mean, of course the sports are, are different and there's different nuances and there's different you know, tactics and strategies and things like that. But, but um, those, we can teach anything, right? If people are willing to listen, we can, we can teach them how to, and we can teach them how to learn things, right? They can learn new strategies and everything like that. But I think sometimes it's overwhelming, right? Because, because we look at the differences first. And there's a lot more similarities between folk style and freestyle than there are differences. So I would say focus on the similarities first. And as we talk about shifting mindsets, winning hearts and minds to be supportive of girls and women's wrestling, this is for both Terry and Julia. Um, what are some of the ways that, that we can do that? How do we shift a national mindset so that we can see the sport of women's wrestling in a, in a new and enlightened way. Go ahead, Julie. I think one of the biggest things, especially for high school coaches um, in particular, one thing that we've been pushing a lot is uh, making girls feel welcome in the space. Uh, I think we kind of saw before 15 years ago where it's like girls shouldn't even be in the wrestling room. And then we kind of hit this transitional period where it started being okay for them to be there. Um, a girl wanted to join the team and a coach would think he was being really progressive by saying like, oh yeah sure you can be here which is awesome that's a huge improvement but now we're getting to a point where you should be inviting them girls in the space don't wait for them to come to you go out in the hallways and start recruiting and saying to these girls you're wanted here not only are we going to say yeah it's okay but but you're wanted that, that you have a place in the sport 
um, I think it's becoming more accepted for women to be in combat sports. You see women headlining UFC cards now. Um, and now it's, it's, it's ridiculous as it sounds. It's okay for a woman to be strong and powerful and athletic and still be a female and still be a woman and, and still be beautiful by doing all those things. Um, and, and just kind of reinforcing those things, not just that it's okay that you're like this, but like, that's cool and awesome. And you're wanted that, 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 that you're, you have a place in the sport, um, and pushing that narrative instead of just, yeah, it's okay. But instead it's like, yeah, this is cool. And, and we want you here. Yeah. And I think just look, look at it from a standpoint of if you, if you knew, that you could influence positively every person and every young kid in your school, right? If you knew you could influence them in a positive way, whether it be male or female, why would why wouldn't you get them involved, right? Why wouldn't you get them involved? Because uh, you know it can't be about what you need as a coach, right? What do you need for your team? I'm going to go look for a heavyweight because that's what I need, right? No, let's let's look about how do we how do we move people forward, right? Because if you know you can move, if this is truly what it's about and what it should be about is moving people forward, why wouldn't you invite everyone in your room? Why wouldn't you put them in front of you? And, and we know this sport can move people forward. We know what it's done for us as coaches and, and as athletes when we were younger and how it's moved us forward. We know the transformation it can make in an individual's life, right? And, and sometimes... You know, we, we need the kids in the room that need this sport more than we need them, right? right. And, and I think that, that that's how I would look at it. Like if you, if you knew, if, you, if someone asked you the question, like how can we move kids forward developmentally, mentally, physically, emotionally, we have it. This is the sport. We, we can move kids forward. Invite everyone in your room, right? And see where it goes. Right? And so that's, that's what I would do. Question come in has come in from Jessica Casperson, uh, head coach, head women's coach at Southern Virginia University. As a coach, what are a few of the things that are not negotiable for your athletes? Well, I, I think that the, the things I talked about, right? I mean, there, there's, uh, I mean, there has to be honesty, right? There has to be honesty um, when you're dealing with each other. There has to be a respect. Right, and uh, those things are non-negotiable. We're not, we're not going to deal with each other in any other way. Right, um, there has to be an integrity to what we're doing, right, and a discipline to what we're doing. Those things, you know, whether we're disciplined doing, you know, running a mile or discipline on the bike, uh, I don't, I don't care. But we, we have to have that, that aspect in there, right? Those, those ethics those those values um those things that you can't negotiate on right um, you can't let someone steal from someone else and be dishonest right you can't let someone lie to someone else and be dishonest and and expect that everything is going to go well right we have to be straightforward as we as we deal with one another in our relationships and i think what you realize along the way is yeah this is a very physical sport but it's a lot more than that, right? It's a lot more of what's between the ears and how we're thinking and how we're dealing with situations. And, and if we can just be straightforward on things, um, everything's going to be better. Last question, and then we will conclude uh, today's webinar. The last question comes in from Raphael Ruiz from Othello, Washington. How can I help girls build confidence in their strength going into postseason, And we have about a two minutes left. So brevity is key. Hmm. How can we have, just again, I would say empower them, right? Empower them, encourage them, give them positive feedback, right? I mean, I think feedback for a female athlete is very important, very, very important for everyone it is, but I think for a female athlete, even more important, right? You have to make sure you're giving positive feedback. I think sometimes, I think as, as male athletes, we can be, you can nail me with all the negative stuff and I'll, I'll get through it. Uh, I think with a female athlete, uh, the more positive you are, the better it's gonna be. Yep, yep. All right. 
Well, Terry, Julia, thank you both so much for taking time again out of your schedules. We have immense gratitude and appreciation for each and every one of you for the work that you have done and continue to do. And we're going to continue growing this sport together. So thank you everyone that's tuned into this Zoom webinar. We're going to send a follow-up email. There was a couple of other questions that could be best answered with some literature. So we'll send out our follow-up Zoom email, attach some documents for review and consideration, and we'll look forward to having you guys. Um, March will be our next webinar, and it's going to be with legend Leroy Smith, the executive director of the National Wrestling Hall of Fame. He's going to talk about fundraising for your college program and how to bring funding into the wrestling space. So we look forward to seeing you all then, and have a good evening. Bye-bye.